Welcome to the Royal Road School of Carmelite Prayer. St. Teresa of Avila tells us that the divine path of Carmelite, or silent prayer, is the Royal Road to Heaven, and that those who travel it will be given a great treasure. A link to the Praying with Teresa of Avila website has been provided below to enable you to easily find the catalog of offerings on this channel, along with the notes, PowerPoint, and audio of today's presentation, Contemplative Dryness taken from I Am a Daughter of the Church by Blessed Father Mario Jen. The website provides all the simple tools that you need to develop your own practice of Carmelite or silent prayer, along with complete course materials to start your own school of prayer in your parish or in your community. Contemplative Dryness an extract taken from I Am a Daughter of the Church by Blessed Father Mario Jen. As the sun, when it rises in the morning, will enter your house if you open the shutter, even so will God, who sleeps not in keeping Israel, enter the soul. Contemplative dryness is the name given the first forms of contemplation described by St. John of the Cross. Between the contemplative dryness and the delightful quiet of St. Teresa, there are points of resemblance that allow us to place them at the same stage of spiritual life. These two forms of contemplative experience introduce us into different spiritual climates. Teresian quiet produces its effects, positive and delightful ones, in the will. The Joannine, or St. John, dryness seems to affect particularly the understanding or the intellect and produces in it effects that are privative, in other words, gloomy, because dazzling with contemplative light. Today's contemplative is generally attracted to the Joannine or St. John of the Cross climate because he finds it more in line with his experience. To avoid all confusion, it is important to say the dryness in question is contemplative. In other words, it bears the three signs required by St. John of the Cross lack of satisfaction in things of God or of creatures, solicitous care about not serving God, impossibility to meditate. Should these signs not be found together, it is best, according to the saint, to return to meditation to nourish the exchange of friendship with God. But when the dryness is recognized as the fruit of God's action in the soul, then it is obliged to both respect God's action and to act itself. The saint likes to insist on the first duty, respect for God's action. Delight is actually not experienced in this dryness because the delight is too subtle for a soul having the memory of former graces and experiencing the wandering of the faculties it tends to arouse in these intellectual temperaments the painful reactions of powerlessness, disquiet, and restlessness. The attitude to be maintained during dryness is marked by suppleness and tenacid, tenacious fidelity. Two directives are suggested to maintain it. First, to tend by faith towards the peaceful region of the spirit and remain there. Secondly, to ignore the turmoil in the sense region of the soul and calm it at times by means of certain activities. So let's take a look at the first, to tend by faith towards the peaceful region of the spirit. We are now in the passive night of sense a passage from sense to spirit by adapting God's actions to one's own. Contemplative light brings about this passage. The first directive points out what must be 
the soul's co active cooperation. The soul should cooperate actively with grace, which affects it, by making acts of faith, such as, God, I believe you're here, I believe you love me, that you have been waiting for me, that you are making me over in your image. The mystics speak of an interior cell, of a depth of the soul, of a more intimate and more peaceful region, which is the seat of God's presence and action in the soul. For St. John of the Cross, the senses and the intellectual faculties immediately relating to them represent the periphery of the soul. Spirit designates its more interior parts. In the Teresian quiet, there is an interior perception indicating that the sweetness arises from a deep source. In this way, it is easy to identify the spirit with those profound regions which produce quiet. The soul understands that it is the movement from sense to spirit that leads it to the water springing up within it. In contemplative dryness, at least initially, grayness envelops the soul and its faculties, reducing them to the powerlessness and immobility. How is one then to discover the location of the spirit? Yet there is the practical criterion of peace and silence within the soul's reach. The senses for St. John of the Cross are the suburbs of the soul where turmoil and agitation reign. Spirit is God's abode where he dwells and acts in peace. It is where he lets himself be grasped by faith and at times allows himself to be experienced as the transcendent reality. The divine dwelling place is silent. It is where the silence of the spirit, he engenders souls to a life of grace. I'm, I'm sorry, it is where in the silence of the Spirit he engenders souls to a life of grace. One can attain it even in contemplative aridity by means of an act of faith. In fact, faith, a theological virtue received at baptism, is the only proportionate and proximate means for attaining God according to St. John of the Cross. It elevates the intellect that submits to it, and with the intellect, the whole soul, bringing it into contact with God, faith leads one into the supernatural world and into that region of the spirit where God acts and gives himself. God's action, which makes faith a living faith, calms the soul. The activity of living faith produces a subtle impression of silence and of peace. The silence indicates to the soul the region of the spirit towards which it must tend. It will succeed in this by making acts of faith. It is the senses which impede the perfect receiving of the Holy Spirit. Is it possible to render them less noxious? to free oneself from their troublesome agitations? Well, let's take a look at the second point, how to ignore the noise of sense and bring it calm. The exercise of faith, although always opening up the soul to God's light, does not always succeed in establishing peace in the lower faculties, which are restless and demanding, preventing the soul's escape into the region of the spirit. What can one do to quiet this noise? The duty of the soul is to pay no heed to this noise, but to escape it by a determined movement towards the region of the spirit. St. John of the Cross notes that the soul that has arrived at perfection excels in escaping the terrors produced by the devil in the senses. 
It runs to shelter in the dark hiding place of faith, in the realm of the spirit. The turmoil of the senses is an excellent means of purification and plays a part in helping one enjoy the silence of the spirit. In this transition period, however, man's way in the spiritual life is less of his own choosing than at any other time. Whether it's his lack of experience as with a beginner that leads him to squander his strength in violent efforts, or his temperament which makes him unable to support passivity, or even the obsessing preoccupation that has invaded the faculties, it is often difficult and at times impossible for a soul to rise above the agitation or to dominate it sufficiently to maintain the peace of the higher regions undisturbed. One gets fatigued. The body grows weary of immobility. Frustration sets in. Discretion is necessary to direct one's strength and sustain the effort of resistance. Let's look at discretion, what it is. Will discretion demand that we leave prayer aside and engage in some activity to find rest? There are, in fact, times when diversion may be necessary. St. Teresa tells us that it is good to leave prayer for, in, for activity. She writes, the best medicine, I do not say for removing the trouble, for I know none for that, but for enabling the soul to endure it, is to occupy oneself with external affairs and works of charity and to hope in God's mercy, which never fails those who hope in him. In the case of contemplative dryness, to abandon prayer for activity because of the aridity experience would ordinarily be to yield to a dangerous and often seductive temptation God, at times, makes himself more sensibly present to the soul in exter <coughs> exterior activities than in prayer. He seems to withdraw himself when the soul goes in search of him and hide behind a thick veil. This confirms the impression of sterility left by contemplative dryness, which puts a seal of certitude <coughs> that contemplative prayer is a waste of time. It's a subtle temptation and a grave danger. During contemplation, light and love flow into the soul. The abundance of light and the unfitness of the faculties to receive it produce dryness. The supernatural effects of light and love seem to remain in the region of the spirit. Hence, the lower faculties are either paralyzed or agitated. When the contemplation ends, the faculties resume their activity. The soul becomes conscious of the work that has been accomplished in it by contemplation and of the riches it has received. The faculties seem to be filled with light and love. Only a moment ago, the soul wearied itself in its search for a God who did not reveal himself and who seemed nowhere to be found. And now this soul, whom aridity has filled with thirst for God, sees all things filled with that hidden God and discovers the divine secrets hidden in their depths. The soul is in a festive mood. The faculties, now at peace, are bathed in light and overflow with supernatural delight. Following the dryness of contemplation, this feast of the soul might cause it to think that it has risen to a more elevated spiritual state. It is nothing of the kind. 
It is the awareness of the benefits of contemplation that is creating this joy which takes place only when contemplation has ceased. What are we to think of one who would seek the joy of the awakening but refuse the immobility of the sleep? This would be the case of the soul so carried away by the spiritual delights found in the activity following contemplative dryness as to think it possible to enjoy these continually by leaving the dryness and giving itself up only to activity. Patience. Contemplative dryness, a benefit to the soul, must be endured. Such is the law. Discretion and patience were never more necessary. In using violence against it, one would quickly exhaust one's forces and disturb the peaceful action of contemplation. Patience is the only effective remedy. When agitation of the faculties is very great, one can try and arrest its harmful effects by exercising some other calming influence over the faculties to allow them to escape into the region of the spirit or keep them in check so as not to disturb contemplation. So now we're going to talk about several calming influences. So to find the means of this happy evasion is, is truly an art and its efficacy only passing. Each one must find what suits him best and change when it's no longer effective. So suggestions only can be given then, not exact advice. The first would be a slow recitation uh, of a favorite prayer, for example. This can stop the first movements of a rising tempest. Vocal prayer is the necess necessary companion of contemplation for those whose habits of activity render the passivity of contemplation intolerable. The soul will devote itself less to the meaning of the words and more to drawing from them the power of recollection they contain. The choice of prayer is of great importance. A psalm, for example, will express the solitude of the soul. Experience will teach one which prayers are most helpful to him. This prayer will, for the most part, be a cry of the soul. The agitation may return, but to gain time is to gain much. Another suggestion would be the attitude of the body during prayer, which is not a matter of indifference and can contribute to calming the soul. The physical attitude, while being restful, must not favor sleepiness and must be a support for it and sustain it in its painful waiting for God. Another we must not forget the tranquilizing influence of the Eucharist. Yes, the Eucharist is another calming tool. The soul in quest of recollection may seek the nearness of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament to enthrall the interior senses. For other souls, complete solitude seems preferable and more conducive to calm and allows the individual to give themselves up completely to divine rapture in the nourishing silence of the desert. Each one discovers his own way to flee through the t tumult to the peace and silence of the depths of his soul. Another tool <clears throat> is at times the soul just must simply groan under its own powerlessness. Calling on God's help 
and the intercession of the saints who bring calm with deliverance. Humble patience is not always a disposition that liberates one, but a humble person always derives from this turmoil a purification. In the silence that comes from powerlessness, from emptiness, St. Teresa thinks of her soul as a garden of which God is the gardener. What matter the manner of soul, provided that it remain peaceful and that God can act in it in full liberty? St. Therese of the Child Jesus admits that she would sometimes go to sleep when the emptiness was too heavy. She was, however, not disturbed upon awakening, for she felt that children are equally dear to their parents, whether awake or whether asleep, that in order to perform operations, the doctor has to sometimes put his patients to sleep. With her gracious story of the little bird, Therese describes her attitude of contemplation, carried on with her gaze steadily fixed on God through all the aridities and the mists, in spite of her weakness and even the sleep that intervenes to hinder it or interrupt it. I see myself as a feeble little bird, yet I dare to gaze upon the divine sun the son of love, and my heart feels within it all the eagle's aspirations. With reckless abandon, it gazes upon its divine son. Nothing frightens it, not wind nor rain, and if dark clouds come and hide the star of love, the little bird does not move. It knows that beyond the clouds its sun shines still, that its radiance is not for a single instant eclipsed. When the clouds keep it from seeing a single ray, its little eyes close, its little head under its wing, and the poor little thing sleeps. When it awakes, it is not at all desolate. It resumes its task of love. The experience of St. Therese sets before us the suppleness of the soul, the suppleness the soul must have if it would hold firm, peaceful, and alive in its faith and open itself wide to the power of these divine, of the divine light that is striking it. The only thing that matters is to watch peacefully in faith, looking up to that loving wisdom whose presence is indicated by the darkness in this mingling of silence and tumult, out of the dark night, divine wisdom causes transforming waters to spring up. Amen.